Now, I just want to ask, how many people have ever been uh, stolen from? Ever had anybody steal from you? How many hands? Mine, Guta. Okay, now let me ask another question. Have you ever um, had anybody say anything to you that really uh, made you feel bad? Or you heard something that somebody was saying about you and you just, it just devastated you? You know, that's, that's what you call a sliver on the banister of life, isn't it? It's a scourge. Thieving and then everything that can happen when you open your mouth. It makes life a curse. And it even makes God sorry that he made us. But you know, God has always intended to bless his people and to make them a blessing. He said to Abraham in Genesis 12, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And you know, today, those scriptures are fulfilled. God wants to bless us, make us a blessing. And that's, that's what we're reading about this morning, blessing man and blessing God. We're looking in uh, chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 28. Paul says, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you, with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So we're in this section where Paul is talking about walking worthy of our calling as saints. And he says, Let him who stole steal no longer. It's really a command in the original language. It means stop stealing. And stealing is something that is ingrained into us. Um, you know, it goes back to the Garden of Eden where man originally took something from God. He said, you know what? The entire garden, everything that's in it, all the earth is yours. I reserve this one thing for myself. You'd think that would be simple. And yet what man did was steal from God. Take what was not his to use it wrongfully. And then, of course, Adam tried to dodge the blame outrageously when God says, did you take of the tree and eat it? He goes, the woman you gave me she did it. And it began a bunch of blame passing. But, you know, at one time or another, everybody has stolen. I'm not going to ask for hands now, but uh, have you ever stolen anything in your life? I already know. Everybody here has already stolen something. Isn't that crazy? At some point in our life, we thought, I can get away with this. I can just do this. Now, maybe you got caught and maybe you didn't. But you know you don't like it when it happens to you. And everybody seems to have this mindset. Government officials, members of parliament, when they get caught, don't you get angry? They siphon off funds. They employ their entire family. And then they just look like in the photograph, in the paper, you know. Or these businessmen who, you know, change the books and all the accounting so that instead of being billions in debt, they are 
doing great and they're going to sell the business to somebody and sell them a ticking time bomb. Or just, you know, not really stating everything correctly on your income tax, stealing from the government. And you know, do it by cash. Just make your transaction by cash. Don't have to report it. They call that Schwarzarbeit there in German. And if you take that money, it's Schwarz. It's black. Well, Paul commands us to stop stealing. And why do people steal? Because they're in it for themselves. That's the connecting factor in every one of these thefts. They're just in it for themselves. Well, Paul says, stop doing that. And instead, be in it for somebody else. Now he says, work with your own hands. Work with your own hands. Let them labor. And what that means is doing something useful, beneficial, not a scam. And what that means is that all work is honorable. I was talking with a fellow who is working at a humble restaurant establishment. And he was mortified that at his age, he's working at this not-to-be-mentioned hamburger establishment. And he's trying to get himself established. I understand that. But to him, he's a failure, utter failure. Just to even mention the mm, where I work, can't do it. And yet, you know, all work is honorable. That's the bottom line. Not only that, Paul says, be in it for someone else. Not only are you being responsible, not only are you taking care of your needs, but then you're also looking out for who's not able to take care of themselves, who has needs that needs help. And the bottom line there is need. We're not talking about, you know, I wish they had my gold-plated air-conditioned doghouse. But I don't have food. I don't have water. I don't have clothing. We're talking about needs on that level. Maybe they're natural disaster victims who have just lost everything they have. Those are the kind of people to look out for. And you think to yourself, okay, I've got my needs met. I'm not going to sleep tonight in a cardboard box. I'm even going to change my shirt tomorrow. I've got more clothing than that. So I'm in a position to help somebody who's not as well off as I am. And when you do that, you become a blessing. And you find that you're satisfied. Even if you don't have what you want, if you're helping somebody else get what they need, you are blessed. Because Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now to live this way, in order to give, requires a change of mind, doesn't it? Because if you're like me, you're always looking for the next thing you can get. And you achieve that thing and you think, okay, good. But I also was looking at this at the same time. And you start adjusting your budget for that. It's a real mindset to get into. But it's a shift away from it's all about me to a thinking about other people for Jesus' sake. And it means trusting God as you seek his kingdom first and his righteousness and you let all the other things be added to you as he chooses. You know, it requires obedience and determination and self-denial because when it, whenever it comes to meeting somebody's needs, my first instinct is to respond, oh no, what am I going to do? How am I going to afford that? Again? So I have to shift gears. My wife is a little better th at it than I am. She's so nice, it scares me. She's so nice that I, I consider whatever she says, that must be the Lord because I would never choose to do that and she's a lot nicer. She's like God. <laughs> she says, oh sure, go ahead. I go, oh, but I never show it on my face. I just kind of 
Maintain the expression, you know? That's right, whatever she said. Babe. We know she's like a real missionary, you know? She trusts Jesus and all that stuff. So I think, okay, I want to be like her when I grow up. But this idea of, you know, I have what I need, not what I greed. So if I'm doing okay right now, today, then I can afford to do something else. Because Jesus said, just worry about today. Tomorrow's going to take care of itself. But me, I'm thinking, end of the month, and then who knows? You know, we dive right off the edge and we're eaten by dragons. I know what's going to happen. So I'm always braced for the next thing of life that's going to come and hit me. But Jesus is saying, hey, come on, loosen up. What about today right now? Do you have enough today? Well, then can you help somebody else today? Okay, I can do that. And it demands that our minds be renewed to think like Jesus. There's no way we can put a, a me-first attitude together with, I'm looking out for other people for Jesus' sake. <laughs> Two things that don't go together. So, we got to think the way he thinks. He says, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom. That's because we needed his life as a ransom. And he met that need. Now, I would not be doing my job as a pastor if I didn't bring this up. But the first person we ought to stop stealing from is God. Now, this is what it says in Malachi chapter 3. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Now this isn't the only place it says that. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, it says, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, you know, it's a shame to let verses like these be twisted by health and wealth guys to say what they don't mean. Because the way they present it is give in order to get. And they play upon your greed in order to say, do you want this? Well, then give and you shall have. But the way they slant it, it's toward material prosperity. It's towards you having that gold-plated air-conditioned doghouse. And that's what, not what the Lord is talking about here. He's talking about having what you need so that you do have an abundance for every good deed. And it's honoring to the Lord first. That's the whole point behind this, is to honor the Lord first, is to say, you know what? Everything I am and all that I have belongs to you, and I'm giving you this part as a token that it all belongs to you, and I'm acknowledging that it all comes from you, and I exist because of you. And so as I offer this to you, I'm depending upon you to take this 90% or 85 or 80 or whatever it is and just stretch it and make it go. I am depending upon you and I put you first. Now, you know, we know this is the object of life, is to put God first. This is how we do it practically. And again, I'm, I'm saying this only for a pastoral thing. I don't mean to put burdens on people. 
And I don't mean to give the impression that God is broke. God is able to take care of himself. You know, it's from my heart that I depend upon God in this way. And I know I'm a pastor, and I know I'm a missionary, but I even discipline myself in order to tithe and to give offerings on top of that. Because if I don't, then I'm not trusting God like a person should. Okay? Just come up, I'm a pastor or a missionary, doesn't mean that I'm not supposed to trust God. So, however it comes in, and it can come in a whole lot of different ways, doesn't matter. I just have made the decision, this part is the Lord's, and then I don't even think about it. And sometimes, to be honest, it doesn't look like I'm going to make it. And I've never been comfortable with that. I don't like it. I despise that. I just think, you know what? I could tithe a lot more. You'd sort of let me have it, huh? But it's all up to you. Now, you know what? I've been doing this for a lot of years. And I can tell you that God has never dropped me on the head yet. Even when I was positive, this is not going to work this month. I am going to die. But funny enough, I'm not dead yet. And I think it would be economic suicide to not give to God. It says, honor the Lord first. Either we believe him or we don't. Now, the people that Paul is explaining this to are just as poor as we are today. There is never a convenient time to give to God. There will never be a convenient time to give to God. We'll never feel like we can afford it. But I just want to encourage you in this, that if you depend upon God, you will never be ashamed. The first person we're to stop stealing from is God. Everybody with me on that? Okay. Now Paul also says, stop saying corrupt things, but give the grace that's needed. You know, as he says here, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. You know what corrupt is? It means it's going from good to bad. It is decomposing. It's rotting. It used to be good at one point, and now it's just going bad, smelly, putrid. Throw in all the adjectives you know. It's that glorious bouquet when you open the organic recycling bin. That first rush of pay you. Okay, and he says, don't let that come out of your mouth. And there are ways we can speak rotten words to make the situation go from good to bad. One way is by gossip. When we take things that we know, intimate facts about somebody, and we betray a confidence and tell it to somebody else. And we can do this in an, in an evangelical way for purposes of prayer. I don't think it requires that. If somebody needs help, we can pray. We don't have to broadcast stuff. But the important thing about gossip to be aware of is it wouldn't be gossip unless it was intimate and not known to many people. That's what makes it sensational, fabulous. Wow, you're kidding. And so, you know, the stuff that you've been entrusted with, that you are privy to, that nobody else is privy to, those are things for you to be faithful and dependable and not spread them. Another way is we can make fun of somebody. We can poke fun. We can raz somebody. Is raz a word used here? You know, you don't come out and say something just nasty and vicious, but you just make fun of them. Oh, da, 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 da. <laughs> and when somebody gets their feelings hurt, it's, oh, I was just telling a joke. Can't you take a joke? Well, it all depends. Did you make somebody feel bad just now because of some 
you know, benefit that they've just received. And, oh, I wish I had something like that. Ha, ha, ha. That's pretty great. How much do you make? Ha, 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 ha. You know, you can really say some horrible things to people and call it a joke. I remember working with a, a fella that said the most outrageous things. And I figured this guy doesn't seem to have any feelings. He was a real insensitive kind of guy attempting this sort of kind of humor. And one day I lost my patience and I scorched him. I mean, I, I said every sarcastic, ironic thing that I could absolutely think of. I blowtorched him. I napalmed him. And he came back to me later and he said, I thought you liked me. And I had to apologize. That's rotten. But you know, it's this little jokey thing. Oh, husbands and wives, when they start making the jokes about each other in the presence of other people, and it's meant to be that machete sort of a, you take that, babe, how do you like that? She goes right back at you. You just want to, I have to go. I think I hear the kids. Horrible when wives and husbands joke about themselves. You know, you can say something to somebody and just totally discourage them. I've seen people do this by nagging. I've seen people do this by just having their own agenda. And they can say things in a way that is devastating because they're so focused on what they want and I'm not thinking about what another's going to hear or what they're going to understand when they hear what's coming out. And it's just rotten. It makes the whole situation go from good to bad. Now, the interesting thing that Paul says here is that people have a need to be built up. He says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. People need to be built up but you know, gossip and what are those other things? Joking, discouragement, it all is focused on me, right? But he says there's people all around you that need to be built up. He says that's what you're supposed to be looking for. Those are the people you're supposed to use your mouth for. Now, the needs that people have for grace are just as tangible as the need they have for water and food and clothing and the other things that we're supposed to work for. So on one hand, we're working to meet people's physical needs, but with our mouths, we can meet people's inner needs that they really have. You know, people have a need for mercy. People are failing all around you. Did you know that? Everybody around you is not doing as good as they wish they could be doing. I don't know anybody who's doing as good as they wish they could be doing. I think if the truth were to be known this morning, we are a room full of failures. And there's a real need to extend the mercy of God. You know, the mercy is where you don't get what you deserve. And you can come to church and just think, okay, you know, I did it. I'm here. Don't expect anything out of me. Okay? And just waiting for the hammer of God to fall, probably right in the worship time. Another need we have is for encouragement. We get beat down like crazy all the time. You wake up and you got the doom hanging over. You know the black cloud that just follows you wherever you go? And just sort of, you know, the sun is shining, the trees are green, the birds are singing, but that's okay because I'm going to die. I got the doom just right over my head. So many people walking around with that and you don't even know why. Like, okay, you're discouraged. Why are you discouraged? I don't know. Right there, nameless dread. It could be wrong. Or somebody could be needing forgiveness really bad. 
and just be feeling this weight of guilt. And they might be waiting for somebody to say, let's pray, let's go to Jesus about this, let's fix it right now. Sometimes we've got to have restoration, but we're not the best ones at doing it. Now, that might be the kind of needs all around us, but how do we know the needs? You know how you find out a need? You ask, and then you listen. And I think to do this, in order to let those words come out of our mouth that are going to supply the need for grace, in a way, we need to just stop talking and listen first and ask questions. And I know what's going to happen now. After this, everybody's going to drink their coffee and have their biscuit and say, how's it going? You know, and expect the question and get the answer. I want to edify you somehow. How's it going? Tell me the truth. I said the truth. You know, this is just a habit of life. Try to catch people when they're not busy fellowshipping and instead just you're the one that listens. You know, something that really strikes me about Joseph when he was in prison, the keeper of the guard put him in charge of all the other prisoners. And on a particular morning, he's walking around doing his jobs and he sees that two guys are having a bad day. You remember that part? One of them is the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and the other one is his butler. Or wait a minute, the baker and the bucket, butler, the two guys. And he notices that they're sad. Now you know, he gets them to tell him their dreams, he interprets their dreams, they get out, it's his ticket out of prison. Everything in his life hangs on that fact. But you know what, if he wasn't looking around, he would never have noticed that they had a need. He wouldn't have met that need. Do you see that? His whole future hung on the fact that he was looking out for other people's needs. Now, he could have just looked at their faces, you know, and said, well, they're in prison. What do they expect? Don't bug me, man. I got problems of my own. And he would have missed it and stayed in prison the rest of his life. But because he was looking, he just happened to, you know, meet the needs of guys. All of a sudden, two years down the line, boom, he's out of prison, shaved, cleaned, and now he's the prime minister of Egypt. Now, all of this happened because he was more concerned about others than for himself. And that's what Paul is talking about. And this also demands a renewed mind. Because Jesus said in Luke 6, 45, out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. If you ask James, he says, well, the tongue is connected right up to hell. That's why everybody gets scorched. But what do you say we disconnect it from hell and connect it to the Lord? And here's the thing. It happens first in our hearts, our attitudes, and the way we look at people around us, the way we're looking to meet needs physically, the way we're looking to meet needs inside, spiritually, emotionally. These are the attitudes we're supposed to have. And first and foremost, we're to be aware of God. You know what he says here in verse 30? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. All of a sudden, he's talking about the Holy Spirit And we're not to grieve him. That means not to make him suffer. Not to make him sorrow. How do we do that? Well, this phrase is used several times in the Old Testament. I'm going to read you a couple of different places. One is in Genesis 6, verses 5 and 6. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. 
Here's Psalm 78, verses 40 to 42. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the enemy. Here's Isaiah 63, verses 7 to 10. I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not lie. So he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them. Now these scriptures sort of illuminate for us what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit. It means to rebel against him, to do evil and wickedness. You think in Genesis, when they're only thinking about evil continually, there's no one, nobody thinking about God. And you know, the moral fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He carries on as though there is no God. So when God is not in our thoughts, we're going to do things that grieve him. This scripture talking about Israel in the wilderness. They provoked him. They tempted God. They put him to the test. In other words, they were sort of auditioning him for the job of God as if he was on probation. And there they were in the desert and they say, we want meat and we loathe this tasteless, what is it? Because that's what manna means. It means, what's it? That's what they call it for 40 years. Honey, pass some more of the what's it, will ya? Well, they were used to garlic and leeks and fish and these big, heavy pow tastes. And they're eating this manna that's light and flavored like wafers baked with honey. And they just say, we're sick of this. You know, we want meat. And they're snarly. They're not even like, oh, Lord, would you please, you know, give us meat? They're testing God. We want meat. Give us meat. Can you think you can handle it? (sighs) Snarly to be married to something like that. So here, all these goodnesses in Isaiah on the house of Israel, and he's afflicted when they're afflicted. When they go ouch, He goes, ouch. But then it says, they rebelled. And they grieved him. You know, ultimately they said, if we go into that promised land, they're going to kill us, they're going to kill our wives, they're going to kill our children. There's no way we're going to go up there and endanger our families. You think we're crazy? And here's God, their father in heaven, Do you think I would tell you to go in there if it was dangerous? Don't you think I'm going to be with you? Look how I pounded Egypt flat. Do you think I'm going to let them do that to you? This battle's mine. You don't have to lift a finger. But ultimately, they provoked him by their unbelief. That was the greatest thing. The single reason how they grieved him is by simply not believing that God is good. Because that's who God is. And that's all we have to do to grieve the Holy Spirit. It's just to believe that he's not good. And that leads to rebellion. It leads to being oblivious to him. And you know, Paul describes the Holy Spirit as the one who seals us for the day of redemption. Marks us out and preserves us until that day. When we get there, We're going to say, thank you, Holy Spirit, for keeping me by your power for this very moment. 
and it's the Holy Spirit who is going to glorify us. He is the Spirit of glory. So here he is, setting us apart and purposing us to be glorified and we can grieve him by just being oblivious to that whole thing. So, in all this, we first want to be aware of him. We want to be aware of others, but we first want to be aware of God. And we, everything we do is for his sake. So we work with our hands what is good. Why? Because it's for him. And we're looking out for other people to bless because of him. And we're going to watch what we say and think carefully about it and listen for his sake. And like he says here, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Why? Because of him. We want to be aware of the Holy Spirit. And we want to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave us. Why? Because we want to be aware of him. Sensitive to him. You know, he's with us always. And we can do things contrary to his nature that make him suffer needlessly. And Jesus told a parable one time illustrating this very thing about being oblivious to all the mercies of God. And it's that parable he told about a servant who was called in to pay back his master. And the amount that he owed was something like 10,000 talents. Now, a talent is just about 100 pounds of gold. If you owed 10,000 bars weighing 100 pounds a piece of gold, that means you're somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 billion pounds sterling, give or take a couple million. You're so far in over your head. And this slave falls down before the king and he says, I'm sorry I blew it all, but I'll take a second job at McDonald's and I'll pay you back. Now, of course, you'd have to work several hundreds of thousands of years at McDonald's to pay back that kind of money. And the king says, you know what? This guy has a lot of problems. I'm just going to be merciful to this poor guy and just forgive him. I forgive you. You don't have to pay that anymore. So the slave gets up and he goes out and he finds somebody who owes him 15 pounds. He grabs him by the throat and he says, tell me what you owe me. Just give me some time, man. I'll pay you back. No. You pay it back now or I'll throw you in prison. I, I get it. I get it for you. No, right now. I got it. Throw him in prison. And the other slaves are sitting around watching that and go, man, this guy doesn't have a clue. And they go back to the king. And the king summons this slave. And he says, you wicked. I forgave you because I had compassion on you. Shouldn't you have had compassion on that guy that owed you that little bit of money? So then the king puts that guy in prison until he gets paid back. How long do you think that's going to take? Just lose the key. Now what strikes me is how oblivious that slave is to how much he's been forgiven. It's a figure that goes right out of our minds to think about that kind of money. Had a thought, but it died of loneliness. Think about what you're in for, what you've been forgiven. It goes beyond money. You know, if it was just money, conceivably you could pay it back. But we're talking about forfeiting your own soul. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There is nothing on earth that is as valuable as your soul. And yet Jesus has redeemed you out of hell. 
And we're to be aware of that. And so, we want to be aware of the Holy Spirit. We want to learn his voice. He's got a still, small voice. And you know, when he's speaking, there's nothing more glorious, in my opinion, than to know, this is God talking to me. And you know when he's talking to you, it usually comes, it can often come, at a time when you'd rather do something else. But he goes, oh, no, 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 I want you to do this instead. <gasps> but that's costly. Yeah, I know, I want you to do it. <sighs> or, you know, I just wanted to do this. No, I want you to do this. It's right at that point where we got to be quick to say, okay, Lord, anything you want, you can have it right now. Because all we got to do is harden ourselves just a wee bit and we could ignore the whole thing. And we can grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus has suffered enough for us. And we, he shouldn't have to suffer anymore because we don't want to go along with his program. He shouldn't have to put up with that. He shouldn't have to put up with, with it for me, but he does. And it's a shame. I'm really confessing it before you. So instead of living in a way that grieves him, Let's rejoice him. That's a verb. You don't hear that one very much. But we can make him glad. We can make him happy and go, yeah, this is right. When we're listening, when we're being sensitive to, when we're saying, okay, I wanted to do this, but I'll just do that. He goes, yeah. That's after my own heart. Because that's the very heart of Jesus. He said, not my will, but yours be done. And what's the will of God? To bless you and make you a blessing and that all the families of the earth would be blessed through you. Why not? So you know, his voice, you can hear it so well in scripture. That's why we read our Bibles. Lord, teach me your voice so when I'm not reading my Bible, I can still know, hey, that's you. And then, just be sensitive in waiting for that time when he says, okay, now I want you to do this. He may not be saying the same thing to everybody else. That's the interesting thing. Everybody else might be over here and he's saying to you, hey, I want you to do this. And you're waiting, well, won't somebody come with me, you know, so I feel a little bit better about myself. No, I want you to do it. If you obey him, you'll probably be doing things differently from everybody else, but that's part of it. Don't wait for everybody else to go along with it, so, you know, travel in safety, safety in numbers. He's going to be talking to you. So you want to be say, okay, Lord. Now, you know, Freely you have received. Of his abundance of grace and mercy we've all received. He says, okay, freely give. And that word freely means without a cause. You received without a cause in you. Everybody you're going to help has no cause to make you do this. It's just give it without a cause. Because he gave without a cause and he's living in you. Isn't it a glorious thing that we can make him happy? That we have it within our ability to actually rejoice him and not grieve him. It's an amazing thing. That only happens, you know, in a relationship. The closer you get to somebody, the more you have the ability to either make them happy or sad. Far away, something happens, well, you know, it's not that close to me. It doesn't mean anything to me, but the closer it gets, the more it means. So think about how close he is to you, that everything you do and everything you think can either grieve him or make him happy. 
and you have it within your ability to make him happy. You think, you know, I'm a failure. I, I'm not perfect. I can't do this. I grieve him all the time. And it's easy to just get wiped out thinking about that. But you know, he's, he's not looking for perfection. He's looking for you to come to him. And this is, this is what he says. Isaiah 66. Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things, my hand is made. And all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. You know, if we come to him, just trembling in his word, that's enough to rejoice him. He can work with it from there. If we come to him, he will come to us. So it's not, it's not a difficult thing, even, to make him happy. You know, as we sometimes have to approach him in that way, he's the one that's going to lift him up, us up. When my, when my kids are resistant to my discipline, that really makes my face get really tough. You don't think I'm right? Well, I'm going to let you know how right I am. But you know, if I just say a word, I got one of my daughters that if you look at her cross-eyed, she's going to dissolve in a puddle of tears. She knows she's wrong and she's dying inside because of it. She's guilt, just... I left the refrigerator door open for an hour. It's my fault. She whips out her ritual dagger, Harry Carey, right here in the kitchen. And you know what? I just say, babe, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. Yeah, Dad, I'll never get it. It's going to be okay, sweetheart. I love you, babe. It's just a refrigerator. You see how that works? So you can come to him and know that it's going to be okay. He's going to make it okay. Amen? Let's pray. We thank you that you're with us according to your promise, Lord. You said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. and especially not forsake us in this, that you'll help us to do what is right with our hands and to look out for those in need and to say what's right and what gives grace. And Lord, we do confess we've spent enough time just living for ourselves and being a scourge to humanity. We don't want to do that anymore. But we can't do it without you. And we do come to you with nothing in our hands. And we just say, Lord, bless us and make us a blessing. Help us to give as you give to us. Help us to forgive as you forgive us. We thank you, Lord, for your salvation and your mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.